All right, welcome back to another episode of Shifting Schools. I'm so excited to uh, continue our conversation here around esports and education, specifically in K-12, but also starting to talk about what this looks like at the collegiate level as well. I'm excited to have my guest with me here today, uh, Gerald Solomon from the NASA Foundation, which stands for Network of Academic and Scholastic Esports Federation. Gerald, you're the founder and executive director of this. Talk a little bit about how this came to be and how, how did you, you start this foundation, this federation? Sure. Well, first, Jeff, thanks. And to everyone out in the audience, I hope you find this informative and helpful. And if you want to know more about us, our, we're a nonprofit. We're global and our website's easy, nasef.org. Um, how it got started. Interesting. It's kind of a long story, but I'll entertain you for <laughs> hopefully a little bit. I was very fortunate that for 14 years... I ran one of the most premier and innovative family foundations um, in the mm. world, uh, Henry and Susan Samueli, the Samueli Foundation. Henry's the founder of Broadcom and a very, very large dot-com chip manufacturer. And I had the honor of being the CEO and the global director of their philanthropy. And as part of our work, we focused on STEM, STEAM education, and youth development. And during my time, I spent literally <laughs> hundreds of millions of dollars of his money on youth programs, education programs around the country and around the world. And after about 10 years, you know, we started to look at how can we continue to be innovative and really reach the kids that are disengaged, disenfranchised, uninvolved, et cetera. And I stumbled across this thing called Esports. I knew nothing about it. I mean, you know, I'm an old yeah. Tetris kind of guy. I mean, that's about it. And um, <laughs> I I stumbled upon it through UC Irvine because our offices were in Newport Beach, California. And I went to my principals and I said, you know what? This is an incredible opportunity. It, to me, is the perfect Trojan horse. But I don't want to play games. I don't want to teach kids how to play games. Your focus is around youth development social emotional learning, STEM and skills development. How can we do this in a way that can reach these kids, get them to see things they otherwise wouldn't see because they're not exposed to it or it's not in their family, whatever it may be, and right. give them an opportunity they otherwise wouldn't have. So I convinced the principals, Henry and Susan, to go ahead and give me some funding. And we created what was then known as Orange County High School Esports League. Okay. And we started with 26 schools, but we started differently. What I did was we gave a grant to the University of California and a grant to the Orange County Department of Ed, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and said, I want to do something different. I want to use esports as a magnet, but I want you to use it to teach kids STEM and STEAM education skills and career technology pathway opportunities. So they wrote an entire high school curriculum, an entire middle school curriculum, all of the tracks for CTE in California. Wow. And after about six months, we submitted it to the powers to be. And fortunately, with a bit of work, we got it approved. We are the only entity in the entire world that has a Department of Education approved full four-year high school curriculum, middle school wow. curriculum, CTE tracks, but it's not about teaching esports. It's about teaching streaming, shoutcasting, web development, coding, event management, data analytics. We integrate fun and play. We gamify learning. We don't teach people about esports. We teach people how to use it for their own personal career and opportunity. And then, as you may or may not know, and we'll talk about it, I'm sure, we went from 26 schools in Orange County, California in 2018-19, where today we have over 3,000 schools in the U.S. alone. We have affiliates in 32 countries in the world. We have over 70 countries where schools participate in our program. And at any given time, we've had 240 to 250,000 students around the world that use our programming, our competition, our activities, and as a global NGO built out of philanthropy, everything we provide to schools and curriculum is 100% free to students around the world. 
That's fantastic. Um, and I know we have a lot of international educators that listen to our podcast as well. Uh, so it's always great when we get uh, organizations like yours that are both, you know, you can do it here in the US, but it's also global as well. And so that's always really great for people to hear as, as they're listening to this a little bit. Talk a little bit about what this support looks like then from you. If I'm a school and I'm thinking, you know, we've been listening to the Shifting Schools mini series on esports now for over a month. I get it, Jeff. Okay, we've got to start an esports program at our school. I'm going to reach out to Gerald and Nasef. What do you do? What do you do? What do you help provide? So we're different uh, to help get a school yeah, started. Yeah, so we're we're an education program. We're not an esports program. Okay. We okay. use esports because it's the soup du jour. I mean, right. we could have done horseback riding, knitting, you know, football. We could have done anything because there's an academic lens to almost any activity you engage in. What we did was in our research. We found the place, the platform to meet kids where they are, to speak a language that they enjoy, and to optimize the reach and the scale of what we wanted to accomplish. Because our ultimate goal is really simple. It's to ensure that as many people around the world have the skills they need to thrive and grow. It's really that simple. That's what we do. Right. We do it through that virtual lens of esports. So what we do is we hybrid between in school and out of school. In the out of school space is generally, although it can occur in school, we set up clubs, like a chess club, a Spanish club, a yearbook sure. club, whatever it After may be. school clubs, yeah. In the club, you have officers and you have structure. Ours is different. We have that structure, but it, the structure is focused around what we call the ecosystem of esports. So mm -hmm. if you went to our website and you hit the toolbar that said curriculum or learning, and then you drop down and hit curriculum, you'll see an infographic. And that infographic has multiple domains around things like strategic development, content creation, innovation, entrepreneurship, et cetera. And then around it, you see what really are aligned to all of the CTE tracks that exist in the United States. And as part of our club, you have to take on a committee assignment. So there's a marketing committee, there's a social media mm -hmm. committee, there's a graphic design committee, there's an event management committee, there's a data analytics committee, there's a committee on streaming, there's a committee on shoutcasting. Every club has to build their own website, they have to build their own social media, they have to build their own marketing plan, they have to create a business plan. They have to then go ahead and create a fundraising plan, a fund development plan. We're teaching them skills around right. innovation, entrepreneurship, business management, et cetera, but we're doing it in a way that's fun to them because, oh, I get to do this for my club. You mean I can create the logo for our school club or I could put on events and get kids together and we could play games. So there's a lot of that fun and engagement. It's really how do you gamify, gamify learning? And, right. and we don't, we have nothing to sell. Um, we don't sell our curriculum. We have over a thousand pages. And it's all aligned with Common Core, NGSS, ISTE, CTE, and SEL. No one else has that either. And what we do is we give these kids an opportunity to learn while they're playing. And again, we don't sell how do you play esports or, sure. you know, just what is... How do you get better right, at this game? Or right. Or, game. or, you know, how do you just stream and shoutcast? You know, examples yeah. are... We have curriculum. I'll just give a very simple example because it's easy for educators and parents and people to understand. How do you do esports in a history class? Well, it's really pretty easy. What you do is, whether it's world history, U.S. history, let's just take the Civil War, Battle of Gettysburg. Let's just take the invasion of Normandy. Let's take the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, all different areas of history that you would take mm -hmm. in a traditional high school classroom. Gamify it. Get the kids to immerse themselves experientially because we know that concept works for learning and let them in Minecraft build the battle, build the platform, build the experience, immerse themselves into it. So now what's happening is students, instead of sitting in a classroom and a teacher just proselytizing or narrating a certain lesson plan and then testing on it, the kids immerse themselves into the experience of what it was like. The people who are doing the graphic design in the esports e program will create the avatars that will be part of the gameplay. 
Um, so it's really this holistic community. We build community, we build culture, but we respect teachers because teachers mm. have devoted their life to creating a curriculum that they know works and is important to them. So we don't say throw out your curriculum and do ours. We teach them through professional development how to make it more fun for kids, how to make it more gamified and more engaging in what they do. I love that. And I think, you know, what we've been hearing is we've been doing these interviews through the mini series is everything that, that you keep harping on is it's not about, you know, when we talk about esports, when we, we say the word esports, I think a lot of us assume that we're just, we're picturing kids in front of a screen with a controller and a headset. And we're all saying, well, we don't want that. And one of the things I love that's coming out about coming out through all of these conversations, including this one we're having with you is it's not about the actual gameplay. Sure, that's part of it, but it's about all these other skills. And as we continually transition into a skill-based assessment era of education, which we are putting push to, we already were, and now AI has pushed us there. And what you're talking about is this building of skills, these different skills. Some people call them 21st century skills. Other people just call them entrepreneurial skills. It doesn't matter. It's we're giving students skills around a set. And it just so happens that we're wrapping it around this thing called esports because that's what motivates kids. And one of the things I always, I always talk with educators about is how are we inviting student culture into our classroom? Mm -hmm. And that's really what this is. This is the culture of our mm -hmm. students that we are now finding ways to invite this into our classroom. And I think part of it is, and I, I want you to talk about this, some of these skills that we have, the idea of like shout casting, I'm going to guess most educators listening to this have no idea what that is. Or how do you set up a multi-stream system that I am streaming from three different locations live on Twitch at the same time is an incredible skill set that most teachers and educators, I'm going to guess, don't even know where to start to get that, Absolutely. That kind and, of thing set up. You know, what, what you're talking about and what many people do, unfortunately, is they focus on the industry of esports and gaming. And they think right. about it as careers within that field or genre. What sure. we do is that plus. What we do is we say, if you can put on an esports competition on Twitch or on whatever platform you use, and you could talk right. to 50 schools and get 50 teams to play, and you could set up brackets, do you know that those skills are the same skills that event managers use at Marriott, Hilton, Hyatt, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, yeah. Dassault Systems, et cetera. You now have a transferable skill, not only within the industry of esports, but outside of that. And then part of what we do, in addition to that exposure and opportunity, is we have the students build out digital portfolios, which mm. is unique. And part of what happens is, as we see today, everything is so competitive, no matter what it is. What's a differentiator? Right. How is Jeff and Gerald different? We come into an interview, whether it's college or work, and we both come in with 4.0s, you know, SAT scores at this or these experiences. What's the difference between you and me? Well, if I come in mm -hmm. with a digital portfolio, just like an artist would do when they're applying to sure. art school or to drama school or whatever it may be, let me show you the artifacts of my learning. Let me show you what I've created, what I've done. That's a big differentiator. And it shows Absolutely. both my skill set and all of the other components that are necessary that an end user, college, university, um, business entity, et cetera, wants to be able to see. If they can go in, in either school or workforce and not spend 12 to 18 months training and developing, but these are people who are skilled and capable of participating mm -hmm. in so many different levels, then we've solved a huge problem in this pipeline and pathway as we try to redefine economic opportunities, communities to thrive and grow, et cetera. Our vision and our goal is very different. I, I'll give you an example. We, I'll be in Singapore soon, and we're training um, an international school program that has schools all over Southeast Asia. Um, mm -hmm. And we're doing it in a way to give kids an opportunity to be able to think about those economic challenges and issues that exist within their communities and country. Perfect example, Singapore imports 70% of all of its food. They have an ambitious goal 
of producing 50% of all their food by 2050. How are they going to do it? They have to create innovation. They have to look at things differently. So we have a program called FarmCraft where we actually teach kids the opportunity to think differently about agriculture, taking product Mm -hmm. to market, what it looks like, how to do it in different environments, different biomes, all different kinds of things. So our world is very much about how do you use gaming for real world relevance? Yeah, I love that. I love that. You talked about your curriculum um, includes and in, in, is embedded into it uh, uh, stuff around SEL, diversity and inclusion. Can you maybe talk to us a little bit about what are some of the things, what does that look like within within your curriculum and with, within supporting schools? Sure. In, in most eSport programs, you have a handful of kids who compete, hmm. five, 10, maybe a few more. But generally speaking, depending upon title, that's a fairly finite number. Yeah. Then you have some kids who just play casually. Because of how we set up our ecosystem in the club format and the requirements of committees, our clubs are not five or 10 or 15. We have some clubs and schools that have over 200 students in them. Wow. And the reason why is because there's a place for everyone. No matter what your gender preference is, the color of your skin, the major that you're pursuing in school, whatever it may be, there's a place to feel safe. There's a place to grow and develop. And there's a place to be able to share what it is that you enjoy and that what you're good at. There's an old saying, um, and you may or may not be familiar with it, and the audience may or may not be, but I would encourage you to look at it. It's called Ikigai. Ikigai is a philosophy from South Asia that talks about how do you find purpose and meaning in life? And if you can help a student do that, then you've accomplished all you can accomplish as a parent and educator, you know, mentor, et cetera. And that's really at the core core of our work as Ikigai. How do we help a student do that? So when you talk about diversity and equity, over... I think it's 72, 73% of our clubs around the world. The presidents are women. That's great. The people who participate are from all walks of life because I don't have to be a gamer to be part of the club. I just have to feel like I belong Hmm. and I want to be part of something that's a social structure and system that makes me feel good, that affirms who I am as a human being. And we have, and we require codes of conduct, codes of conduct that we have templates for. But you as a team, as a club, as a school, take it and recreate it in a way that makes sense for you. We require that everyone sign it. We then require that at least once a month, you actually review the code of conduct and you make sure you're adhering to the concepts of diversity, equity, inclusion, fair play, respect, honesty, openness, those types of characteristics that we all want in that social emotional learning evolution of an individual. Do you, is there, is there a community that you run, uh, for all of these, for all of these clubs to be able to reach out to each other and mm-hmm. to connect? Do you do that? Is there, is there a, I'm just thinking in my mind, there's gotta be like a massive <laughs> discord server somewhere. That's got 250,000 so, yeah, really. kids from around the world, which would be awesome. For uh, students, it's, for students, it's much more limited because we take, uh, we're very, very, um, conservative around PII, personal data privacy. Yeah, okay. Um, and we oftentimes anonymize our students. Again, we don't have VC money that we have to be accountable to. We don't need student data information. We don't sell. We don't market to. We don't do any of that. We don't have quarterly returns. I got to go to an investor and say, this is what it is. I mean, granted, we struggle to raise money, but we do everything for free. So we don't need to account for that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what we do is we have affiliates around the country and around the world. We hold monthly calls, web calls, where we bring them together. We have a community library where everyone can add to, access, and talk about. We have office hours uh, by some of our educators and teachers who just answer questions and facilitate conversations. Um, So we have lots of different ways in which to do it. And then, you know, myself and others, we do a lot of travel. We actually, like I said, you know, I'll be in Singapore doing training, I have the pleasure of, in, in honor of being on a panel for the first uh, International Olympic esports program in the world. Um, in June, I'll be on one of their panels. 
Um, we, we bring people together everywhere and anywhere we can using digital and in-person platforms to be able to do that. That's fantastic. And I, and I love, I just love everything that you're saying. And this is one of the great things that I loved about, about doing this, um, mini series on esports is much like you, my esports stopped at duck hunt and Tetris. Uh, and that's kind of where uh, yeah. I, you know, it wasn't, so it's been fun to be able to dig into this and see how many different ways there are to get kids involved in something like esports. And I just keep going back to, you know, and you've, you've done such a great job about talking about this, about the different ways that you can get involved and the different skill sets. And I just try to think of if I'm a kid today and my club choices after school are the esports club or the chess club where you either play chess or you don't versus esports where I can be in charge of marketing or logo design or streaming or event planning. Or, I mean, there's so many more avenues and, and play games, uh, yes. you know, and supporting, everything that, that the, that the club does. I think there's just so many more ways when you just start thinking about that club mindset, a club like this involves so many more people and can yeah. involve so many more people and, than and, just and, playing and, the game. You know, in addition to our curriculum being free, our competitions around the world are free as well. We don't oh, charge a student to play. Um, sure. We have some competitions like we fortunate enough, we have the contract with California and CIF to run all of their high school competitions for esports. We have other arrangements with other places as well, but we also have this like open play where kids can just come in when we set it up and they can just participate in play. Things are all monitored. There are educators, there are adults in the room who participate. Everything's in a closed system. Um, but, you know, that's the attractor. That's what brings them together. Uh, but then at the end, you know, of a play, whether it's, you know, intramural, for lack of a better term, or right. competitive, um, it's more than just debriefing the competition. It's also talking about communication and strategies. And I mean, imagine at the end of a League of Legends uh, game, the amount of data that gets generated that you can download and then you can get the algebra and statistic whiz in your club and say, <laughs> okay, now create an algorithm for us and help us think through how can we improve our play mm. based on statistics to do better in our next competition. So there's space and place for everyone. The play is the fun part. Yeah. Um, but also the fun part for many could be, I like to doodle, so I want to build the next avatars, yeah. or I want to do our social media. I love production, so I'm just going to do TikTok every day for our yeah. club. <laughs> and I'm going to make little TikTok videos, you know, for everyone. That's so, great. so, so it really is an opportunity to bring so many different people yeah. into it. Again, we're not focused on esports. Granted, that's the magnet and that's kind of the attractor, but you know, that's what it is today. It wasn't that way 10 years ago. What will it be in 10 years from now? That's so so what we've created is a curriculum and a program and an approach that can morph into whatever the content piece is. Mm. We're agnostic ultimately to the content. I love that. If a teacher wants to get started and they're like, okay, I'm ready. Here, what's their first step? What's the first step sure. of reaching out? Where do they well, go? What, what do they easy. do? Uh, on our website, nasef.org, there's a little button in the top right that says join NASEF. It takes less than five minutes and it's free. And that opens up a slew of stuff, including opportunities for scholarship for kids, free access to Canva, just lots of different kind of things that are out there. If you're comfortable and you can take the information, it's kind of like in The Wizard of Oz, the curtain pulls back and you get yeah. access to stuff. Um, if you're comfortable in playing with it and using it, great. If you want more, that's where we will go ahead and mm. try to generate some revenue. We'll do specialized professional development PD. And we have a program that's online that you can have licenses for, for eight steps of success, how to coach, educator development, how to integrate curriculum, all of that. Or we could do it live. For example, Kevin Brown, who helped create our curriculum from Orange County Department of Ed, Kevin speaks 11 languages. Freaks huh. me out, but he speaks 11 languages. Wow. He is in demand, as you can imagine. In about 10 days, he's going down to Bogota, Colombia for us, and he's doing an entire training 
in Spanish. Wow. After that, he's going to Singapore with me, and then he's going to Japan, and he's going to do training for educators all in Japanese. Um, so it's, you know, you, you just adapt. You, yeah. And we're fortunate enough to have passionate people who can take this and use it in a different way to really help and adapt to local culture, local education systems. Um, everything is different, and you've got to be able to be adaptable that way. Yeah. Awesome. Well, as we get ready to wrap this up, thank you so much. Uh, again, we will have links to everything over in the show notes. That's nasef.org. That's N A S E F.org. Uh, click that join button and uh, pull back the curtain and see all the resources. But before I let you go, I'd love for you to share a story, uh, that maybe you have from a school or a kid or, uh, just a, a great story for educators to just kind of leave them with around some of the things that, that, you sure. do and some of the things that this can do for kids. Um, I'll, sh I'll share a couple. One, go to our website and look up um, something called Why We Game. We do something called Beyond the Game Challenge, which is not just title play, but we actually do contests and challenges and competition around logo design, web development, um, blogging, different things like that. We did a Beyond the Game Challenge where people had to go ahead and narrate and video and upload um, why they game and what it's meant to them in their life. It's an incredibly moving video. Um, one of the stories from that is a young boy who never fit in and always felt ostracized and was very uncomfortable in his own skin. He started to play games and he realized that this was something that was of value to him. He subsequently um, was diagnosed with autism. Mm. And he realized that a lot of his insecurities and his challenges were physiological, just, you know, things that he couldn't control um, that were just part of who he was as a human being. He was able to take his interest in gaming and esports through us and excel not only in gameplay, but take on a leadership role in a school in an area where he wouldn't even have walked into a classroom to say hello to someone. Hmm. He did it because this is what his passion is. He figured out how to manage and what to do. So that's one example. Another one that has always been touching to me was when we did our first competition. Um, well, actually, I'm going to tell two more stories. Uh, our first competition was we had a mother and father from Vietnam who came to us at the end of the competition. And the mother literally was crying. And she said, I cannot tell you how meaningful this has been. We moved here. My son was 12 from Vietnam. He had an incredibly difficult time adapting socially and with English language. What you created in esports and as a NACEF club and gave him a safe space to be able to explore who he is, what his interests are. And he wasn't judged for his limitations, but he was a really good gamer. Mm. He became a key person within this club. And his parents said, my child learned more English in six months <laughs> being part of the NACEF club than in the eight years that he has lived here in the United States with us. Wow. And it's just absolutely remarkable. Um, and then uh, there was one more story I wanted to share, uh, slipped my mind. But anyways, we have, you know, the, the anecdotal stories are clear. I mean, they're all over. And the one thing that I did mention, Jeff, if I may, is we also are, are the only entity that went through a full four-year IRB review and assessment. We mm -hmm. gave a grant when I was with the Samoli Foundation to Dr. Steinkuhler. She assessed over 3,700 kids, 1,400 teachers, over a period of four years. And all of that's been published. It's all IRB approved. Again, we're not about gameplay. Right. We're about how to use it for science and technology, engineering, arts and math development, and social emotional learning. And we have a rich history of data that is on our website that you can access that shows that when you do it intentionally and strategically with a government approved curriculum like we have, you can actually make a huge difference in kids' lives. 
Well, thank you so much. And I agree with you. You know, there is, uh, we all know this, that when you have an engaged kid and you can motivate kids through what engages them and make learning personal, that you see greater strides than you do any other day of the week. Uh, and that's really what this is about, right? Is it's just using this very popular thing, the playing games, uh, known as esports, and using it to motivate kids in all kinds of certain, all kinds of ways uh, in our classrooms, uh, and build all kinds of skills. And that's really what this is about: uh, is finding avenues to reach to reach kiddos. That's that's what we're all about. That is what education is at its core. So, uh, Gerald, thank you so much for uh, for being here today for, for uh, everything you're doing with NASA. Congratulations on being on the Olympic community. Uh, I think that that is fantastic. Uh, again, a global company, you can go over to uh, nasef.org. That's N-A-S-E-F dot org. Click that join button and uh, pull back the curtain on all of the resources, the curriculum and things to get started. If you feel like this might be something you want to bring to your school or this is the next step for you to start setting up clubs at your school, that's what we're here for. Gerald, thank you so much for joining us today on Shifty Schools. Appreciate it. And I'll talk to you in the future. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everyone.